Now let's move on to the other type of parasite known as helminths or worms. These are multicellular parasites which cause eosinophilia in its human host. This is because eosinophils contain major basic protein, which is released in an attempt to kill the worms. There are three types of helminths, nematodes or round worms, cestodes or tapeworms, and trematodes or flukes. Let's start with the nematodes, which we've broken down into those that cause intestinal infections and those causing tissue infections. Enterobias vermicularis, or pinworm, is a small nematode, about one centimeter long. Enterobias infection is the most common helminth infection in the U.S., which means it is one of the most important ones for you to remember. Transmission is via fecal-oral transmission of eggs, which hatch into larvae in the intestines. The larvae then mature, mate, and adult females migrate down and out of the anus, where they lay eggs in the perianal skin. These perianal eggs are responsible for an intense perianal itching seen in infected hosts. Children who engage in thumb sucking will consume the eggs again and further continue the fecal oral cycle. Pinworms most commonly affect children and can be diagnosed using the scotch tape test, where a piece of tape is pressed against the perianal skin and examined for eggs. Treat with mebendazole or any of the bendazole family. You will notice that all of the drugs causing intestinal infections can be treated with this family of drugs. The mnemonic is that worms are bendy, and therefore you should treat them with mebendazole. Ascaris lumbricoides is also known as a giant round worm because it can grow to be 13 inches long. It is the most common helminthic infection in the world, especially in tropical areas of the world where poor sanitation is frequent. Transmission is fecal-oral via ingestion of eggs from contaminated soil. The eggs will hatch in the digestive tract and larvae penetrate the intestinal wall where they cause an intestinal infection with diarrhea, vomiting, and nausea. Trichinella spiralis is sometimes known as the pork roundworm because transmission can occur by ingesting larvae in undercooked pork. Larvae mature in the digestive tract, penetrate the intestinal wall, and can enter the bloodstream where they often migrate into muscle. Remember this because diagnosis is confirmed by muscle biopsy. In addition to GI symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, you may also see high fever, eosinophilia, and periorbital edema as the migrating larvae reach peripheral tissues. Strongyloides stercoralis infections occur when larvae and contaminated soil penetrate through the skin. This usually occurs through the feet when someone is walking around outside barefooted. From the site of entry, larvae migrate through the blood, mature and mate in the digestive tract, and females lay their eggs in the intestinal wall. This can cause abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, and anemia. You may hear about the string test that was once used to diagnose this helminth infection. A patient swallowed a long string that reached the duodenum, after which larvae could then be pulled out via the string. Today, however, serology has largely replaced the string test due to its high sensitivity and specificity. Ancelostoma duodenal and Nicator americanus are known as hookworms because they have a characteristic hook in their mouth that allows them to attach to intestinal mucosa. Just like strongyloides, larvae of these two hookworms are found in contaminated soil and penetrate the human skin, usually through the feet. An intestinal infection as well as microcytic anemia can occur as the adult worms attach their hooks to the intestinal mucosa and feed off the host's blood. Next are the nematodes causing tissue infections. The larvae of Draconculus medinensis lives in tiny aquatic crustaceans. These crustaceans are ingested in drinking water. The adult worms migrate to the skin and release their eggs. This results in skin inflammation, ulcers, and painful subcutaneous nodules. Treat with neuridazole. Onchocerca volvulus is the cause of river blindness. The black fly carries this worm and releases larvae into human skin during a bite where they mature into adults. The adults mate and release microfilariae into subcutaneous tissues. These migrating microfilariae cause an inflammatory response characterized by a thick, hyperpigmented pruritic rash. If these microfilariae reach the eyes, local inflammation can cause blindness, which is known as river blindness, because this worm is endemic to where rivers are found. Treat with ivermectin, which is effective against microfilariae only. Loa loa is found in Africa. It is transmitted by the deer, horse, or mango fly and causes swelling of the skin. Adult worms can sometimes be seen migrating through the conjunctiva. Treat with diethylcarbamazine. Wuchereria bancrofti is transmitted by mosquito bites that release the nematode into the blood. 
microfilariae reach the lymphatic system and mature into adults. Fibrosis around these adult W. Bancrofti leads to obstruction of the lymphatic system and subsequent edema and scaly skin of the genitalia and lower extremities can be quite severe. This is known as elephantiasis. Treat with diethylcarbamazine. Toxocara canis is similar to Ascaris lumbricoides, but it can only complete its life cycle in dogs. Therefore, transmission is via ingestion of eggs and soil contaminated with dog feces. The eggs hatch and larvae penetrate the intestinal wall, just as in Ascaris lumbricoides. Larvae can penetrate the intestinal wall, enter the blood, and migrate to many different organs, causing disease known as visceral larva migraines. Involvement of the eye can lead to blindness. Now onto the cestodes are segmented flatworms which are all transmitted by ingestion. Tinea solium or pork tapeworm is one helminth that can present as two different diseases depending on whether the egg form or the larvae form was ingested. Ingestion of the larval form in contaminated pork leads to intestinal colonization and mild GI symptoms. Ingestion of the egg form occurs through fecal oral contamination and leads to the more serious disease, cystercycosis. In this situation, the egg form hatches in the intestines, allowing the larval form to then penetrate the intestines, enter the bloodstream, and affect any tissue. Neurocystercycosis is diagnosed when the larval form has penetrated the brain or spinal cord. The scolex or head of tinea solium has four suckers and prominent hooks that give the helminth its ability to attach firmly to the intestinal mucosa. Treat with prazocontal. The next cestode is Diphalobothrium latum, which is ingested in undercooked or pickled freshwater fish. You will really only encounter this worm on the boards in the context of vitamin B12 deficiency and macrocytic anemia. This is because this long worm, which can grow to be several meters long, can attach itself to the intestinal wall and compete with the host for nutrients, especially vitamin B12. As a result, the host will become vitamin B12 deficient and present with megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. Treat with prazoquantal. Last of the cestodes is a Kenococcus granulosus, which is contracted by ingestion of eggs from canine feces. Larvae hatch in the GI tract, penetrate the intestinal wall, and migrate to target tissues, especially the liver where they form hydatid cysts. These liver cysts can present with right upper quadrant pain and hepatomegaly. Diagnosis is made by seeing the cyst in tissue on x-ray or CT. Here is an image of a typical cyst at removal. Surgeons must be extremely careful when attempting to remove these cysts. Rupturing them can release echinococcal antigens, which can cause a severe anaphylaxis reaction. Therefore, surgeons will inject ethanol into the cyst before disturbing it in order to kill the echinococcus daughter cyst. Treat with abendazole. Now on to our three trematodes, which can all be treated with prazoquantil. Remember, trematodes are non-segmented flatworms. They have complex life cycles that involve snails as an intermediate host. First are the schistosomas, whose larvae are released into fresh water and penetrate through the skin. There are two schistosoma species that you should know, schistosoma mansoni and schistosoma hematobium. Early infection can present with constitutional symptoms and with granulomas, fibrosis, and inflammation of the spleen and liver. Late manifestations are due to chronic inflammation and can present with portal hypertension due to S. mansoni infection. Maturation of S. hematobium in blood vessels supplying the bladder can result in squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, presenting with hematuria, dysuria, increased frequency, and urgency. Remember these buzzword associations. Portal hypertension and S. mansoni, squamous cell bladder cancer, and S. hematobium. Next is Clonorchis sinensis, which is endemic to Southeast Asia. Larvae are ingested in raw or undercooked freshwater fish. The larvae migrate through the GI tract and mature in the biliary tree. A mnemonic that might help you remember this is that the clon orcus climbs the biliary tree. Inflammation of the biliary system can lead to pigmented gallstones, and there is also an association between clon orcus and cholangiocarcinoma. Remember the buzzword associations among biliary disease, cholangiocarcinoma, and clonorchis. Last of our worms is Paragonimus westermanni, which is endemic to Asia, Africa, and South America. Eggs are ingested from infected shellfish. Symptoms of infection include hemoptysis, fever, and cough. 
Remember the buzzword association between Haemoptysis and Paragonimus westermanni. Now that we've finished going over the worms, we want to make sure that you can remember them. This fact provides two mnemonics that help you remember how some of the nematodes get into our bodies. Enterobias, Ascaris, and Trichinella are all ingested and form the word eat. Strongyloides, Ancylostoma, and Nicator all enter our bodies by penetrating through the skin, usually through the feet. They form the first three letters of the word sand. As we've gone over each of the worms, I've tried to highlight certain buzzwords that you should remember in association with each worm. These are relisted here in one place for quick reference. This section is simply to remind you not to confuse typhoid fever and typhus, which sound similar. Remember that typhoid is caused by Salmonella typhi and typhus is caused by Rickettsia species.